this morning, our, our scripture, our gospel lesson, um, it's going to find Jesus um, being questioned by, by some of the religious leaders, some of the people of his own faith, about which is the most important, which is the greatest rule, command, law out of Steve again. It's how many? Oh, come, 613. <laughs> he loves that number. 613 of them. And even more that get broken down from those, and they want to know which is it? Which among all those rules, those laws, is the greatest of all? Jesus' response, he recites the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's a central prayer of, of the Jews from Deuteronomy. It's recited first thing in the morning and at night and, and many times in between. The center of faith. And then Jesus, he goes on and, and he adds the Vahavata. It, it, it's from the very next verse in Deuteronomy and is often attached to the Shema that, that says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, how? How do you go about loving God? Well, it's that second commandment. And people are like, oh, well, that's Jesus' addition. He's adding on that the best way to do it is what? By loving neighbor. And loving neighbor as self, loving neighbor who in Jesus' eyes, is everybody. Really loving the whole of humanity, the whole of creation. Do that, and you've pretty much done it all. But be careful. Jesus didn't really just add that all on his own. It really was nothing new. That, that piece, it comes from Leviticus. Jesus is really just calling the religious leaders and us today to what God has always been about love, an abiding, complete love. So hear the word now as it comes to us from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered. The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself there is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After this, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be God. It was yesterday, the day before I heard it, uh, um, th that it was a report coming out about um, some surveys that have recently come up uh, about um, people's view of each other, uh, especially in political partisan terms. And, and that was found in the survey is that in the last five, six, seven years, um, such a radical change, people on both sides of a partisan divide viewing the other side exponentially greater than ever before with distrust, with a sense of a lack of integrity, with a sense of ill will and evil. 
when many years ago there was a portion that saw it that way, but most saw, yes, it's a different view, but saw some integrity in those people. And now that's fallen by the wayside with the great majority of saying about the other, no. It's a sign of our times. Divisive, angry social media threads of personal destruction. Um, vile rhetoric failing to acknowledge one another's humanity. All of it with language. Wow. The language so often used, so revolting. It's just really not okay. It's hurtful and it, it causes hateful actions in our world. Being a jerk. Being a jerk is never a good thing. Certainly is not a faithful thing. And absolutely isn't loving. Faith. Faith calls us to be the adult... No, that's wrong. That's not fair to children. Because it's really adults that are especially creating the vitriolic behavior. So maybe it, it's what we're called to in faith it is being the ones who choose a better way, a more faithful way, a loving way, if you will. So, so try this on. I've shared this with a few of you before. I, I'm, I'm sorry for that, coming back to this. But, but, but it's just right in this moment, I think so fitting, um, when I saw some of the very worst signs I've ever seen in a 70-something-year-old's front yard in a little village in western New York, signs maligning, ripping apart individual politicians, so many of them, and other individuals locally and nationally, ripping at people of other faiths, of other political leanings, wild character assassination, using the, the most vulgar, vile, violent and vitriolic language. My first thought, I feel so badly for the people who live right across the street. How do they explain what's on those signs and the hatred to their children? What must it be like every time they look out their front window or drive out their driveway that that's the first thing they see? Uh, honestly, even, if, if, even for those who agree with the guy's politics. Just awful. Sad, hurtful, but even more for the people, for whole groups of people, and for individuals, for them, the people he was humiliating, defaming, vilifying with his signs, and not just in his yard, uh, um, he also put those same signs, he had them made up and put them on all the sides of his pickup truck. And, and bless you. And he drives through that village under five miles an hour, causing others to have to drive slowly behind him. And, and for those out along the road to have to look at the signs, clearly trying to provoke others. That, that, that kind of behavior. That, that kind of behavior, it just doesn't do any good and it certainly isn't faithful. And, and, and when somebody behaves like that, when somebody acts like such a jerk, I, I knew standing by idly, ignoring it, when it's vilely hurting whole groups of people and individuals, I know I needed to do something. Doesn't love, wasn't that in the piece you just sang? Doesn't love compel us? To, 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 to do that for the weak, the poor, to, to stand up for them, those who are being mistreated. So, when I saw his bright red Ford Ranger pickup truck parked just outside the little village's post office, a, a post office that holds maybe two, three people at most, and then it's crammed, um, I, I knew he had to be inside. 
So, so as I made my way up the ramp towards the post office, the, the, the guy um, came out, a guy I had never met before, the, the one with the pickup truck came out and, and he said this great big hearty hello with a smile. This I thought. This was my moment to stand up for those who'd been hurt. This was my opening. So instead of responding in kind, I turned my head and I ignored him. That'll show him, I thought. He'll know exactly why I did it. And, and then he'll go home and he'll reflect and realize, ooh, what I've been doing is all wrong. And, and that he would change his ways. My work done, I watched as he walked over to his pickup truck where I thought maybe he'd rip off some of the signs and went around it and got into an SUV. Shamed. I walked into the post office and saw the real owner of the pickup truck with all those signs and I said a gentle, humbled, embarrassed hello. And walking away, it hit me. While he may have been a jerk in his actions, I hadn't been loving at all in what I was doing. And instead of engaging his mean-spirited ill with love and compassion, I offered ill right back, being a jerk, just like he had been. And that doesn't do anybody any good. Did you ever notice what Jesus did? Jesus always, always tried to understand people who were different, even those who were seen as problematic in their world. And, and what did he do? Tried to understand them and then engage them in love. Why? Well, well I suppose it's because it's the faithful thing to do. And it's the only way to create change for good. Wasn't that what Jesus was saying in Matthew when he said, what did he say? Those who live by the sword will do what? Die by the sword. And then wasn't it Dr. King who said, do you remember what Reverend King said? Hate does what? Begets hate. Hate. And said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love. Only love can do that. The gospel's absolutely clear. There's no ambiguity at all. The answer, the answer is always the same. It really doesn't matter what the question is. The answer is always love. Now, a lot of people say, oh, come on, love, love, love. Really? Isn't that a, a little bit naively simplistic? It, it doesn't take seriously the complexity of our world, the difficulty of living among 7 billion people, the, the ways in which things just are. So squishy. So weak, so soft, they say. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. Love, love is the one true eternal. Th that's what Paul, remember he says in 1 Corinthians, Paul, the rule guy, ultimately says it's just one thing. It's love. Love is the only thing that stands the test of time. You can do all other things, live all other things faithfully, and if you don't have love, what does he say? It's for naught. It's worthless. It's useless. Love, says Paul, is at the center of it all. It's what the Gospel of John says about God, too. For God so loved the world so loved the world that he gave his, what, only son? So loved the world, not, not, not some of the world, not just a few, but the whole of it, which means also each part within it. And that's a really big deal, seen as the first letter of John says, 
That's actually the definition of God. First John says, God is love. At core, that's the essence of God's being. Pure, untainted love. Who is God? That's who God is. And so says Jesus. That, 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 that's what you and I should be about as well. Always, period. The greatest command. Maybe it's the only true one because all those other, the 613 and, and the ones that play out from that, those are just to help us, to guide us in the midst of love. But it is love, love of God and love of neighbor. Ultimately, what it's all about. Really? Love squishy? No, never. Now, now, thin love. Thin love can be squishy. We use the word love pretty loosely. A and that sort of love, maybe it doesn't mean much. Maybe, maybe it's easily dropped without any longevity. But that's not true with deep love, with thick love. Deep love has the tenacity to withstand the worst disappointment, even betrayal. Deep love has staying power that can't be shaken. Just imagine it. That's the story of Easter that's just around the corner. Even Jesus' closest friends are going to deny him and betray him. And what does Jesus do? He stays the course. Why? How? How could he do something like that? Because he's got the love of God embedded within him. Sometimes it's in little ways, too. I, 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 I love the little... I love. That's thin love. It really should be I like the tale. Um, I, I like the tale about Mahatma Gandhi. Um, it, it says that Gandhi was traveling across India by train, and, and as he stepped onto the train. Right as he was stepping on, the train started to move when he was only half on, and his foot caught on the step outside, and it caught his sandal, pulling it off, leaving it on the tracks. And then immediately, Gandhi, now in the train, his one sandal out on the tracks, reached down, slipped off his other sandal, and quickly threw it down the tracks to be next to the other missing sandal. And his companion looked at him. What are you doing? Gandhi smiled and said, just think about that poor man who finds my shoes by the railroad tracks. Now he'll have a complete set. How's that love? If, if he'd been like most of us, like me, he would have been mad. He would have been mad in that moment that he'd lost his shoe. Maybe blame the train for taking off just as he was getting on. How did they do that when they knew I had to get on? Or maybe blaming the person who made that stool that he stepped on to get on. How did they make it so that it could catch my shoe? Or maybe blaming the maker of the shoe that it didn't have a good enough fit to stay firmly on. Or maybe just being mad. Just being mad at his misfortune. Now he had no shoes for his journey. But love, love sees every moment as an opportunity to make good of the situation for the world in good moments and in bad ones. And it's not always in the great big things. Sometimes so small as a lost shoe and then making it to bring good to the world. Really? How do you do that? How do you see each and every person as neighbor, as neighbor to be loved? Um, it, it's not easy when we disappoint each other so easily. How do we run the race with perseverance, as Paul liked to say? To, to not lose focus, to not give up when we become frustrated when something causes us to be disheartened. I think of a piece written by um, Marty Ludi. Um, Ludi lives in Lowell, Massachusetts, um, just a couple of blocks from where my daughter lived 
when she was working in Lowell with gang members coming out of prison to try to stem recidivism with gang members. Um, Mary Ludi um, is a former seminary professor, and, and she wrote this about tenacity. In the late 70s, said Ludi, my white suburban church proposed a partnership with a black church downtown as a way to promote racial harmony. Soon, we were hugging each other monthly at youth group exchanges and potlucks. We began including spirituals in our Sunday services. We shouted, Amen, when their pastor came to preach at our place. We raised money to repair their church's roof. Harmony reigned. Harmony reigned. Until it didn't. Uh, until somebody mentioned a recent police shooting. Uh, until somebody said racism, and it wasn't a white person who said it. Uh, until somebody raised their voice and somebody else cried. Until we white folk began feeling unappreciated. We were making an effort, weren't we? That, that partnership drifted. And then it ended. Back in the suburbs, we never asked why. We never learned that those periodic encounters were at best a warm-up for the long crucifying work of self-confrontation, repentance, and conversion. We never grasped in our bruised innocence and sentimentality that harmony is easy justice is not we should have been praying more in those months not for harmony but for endurance for the grace to not grow weary over the long haul to preserve through the hard stuff so that one day we could move our toes off the starting line we'd mistaken for the finish and actually run the race all those months, we should have been considering Jesus so as not to lose heart at the first sound of hammered nails. That Shema, the Lord God is one. Morning, noon, and night repeating those words. And the words of the, the Havata, love God with heart, mind, and soul. And those words from Leviticus, to love your neighbor as yourself, repeating those words over and over again throughout the day so that they repeat in our heads without ceasing those words always on our lips, always on our lips so that with tenacity love love no longer is a question it becomes the only way we know amen To love somebody when all is well and good is so easy. We feel good about the person. We like that person. It's loving in the difficult moments. That's the hard work. And so it is with giving. Giving is easiest when we feel like we have received gift upon gift and we give in response. The hard work of giving and the giving that makes a difference, like the hard work of loving that makes a real difference, is in those moments when it isn't right within us and we give anyhow because it transforms us and makes us more complete, faithful, and ultimately loving. Loving as reflected in the gospel. Loving as reflected in Jesus. Loving as reflected in God, the one who is said to be the essence of love itself. Let us so give. <laughs>